been a big week. Everyone is talking about the Texas court's ruling. A federal judge has put the brakes on mifepristone, a synthetic steroid used for medical abortion, often in combination with the prostaglandin, mesoprostol. Now, mifepristone might be removed from the market, maybe not. We don't know what the regulatory fate will be. We don't know if the FDA is going to obey the court ruling or not. There's a there's a dueling court ru- ruling from Washington State. This is likely to go to the Supreme Court. People are talking about all aspects of this. I won't get into it all, but I want to talk a little bit about, I think, the interesting regulatory questions at the heart of this ruling, and maybe even more broadly on something that we were talking about in Sensible Medicine that keeps coming into the fray, which is who's in charge here, the FDA or the courts? Who should be policing the FDA? Now, what do you need to know about this? Well, you need to know in 2000, mifepristone, which is a synthetic steroid, uh, RU486, which had been used in France since the 1980s, was given accelerated approval in this country for medical abortion, which is taking pills to have an abortion. And basically, the approval basis was three uncontrolled studies where they just gave a lot of women who wanted to have an abortion this pill and saw how many of them were able to have it successfully. It was in the 90-some percentage points in the United States study. There were a few women who required some subsequent surgical procedure, and that's why people think it's part of a strategy where you can try it, and then you can try mesoprostol, maybe try mesoprostol again, maybe try another dose of mifepristone. That's what the FDA would later authorize. And then if you really were having trouble, you could go get a surgical abortion. So that's really how it's sort of thought of medically. Now, when the FDA granted that accelerated approval, there were some cases against it. Um, those have been put on the back burner for many, many decades. And if somebody wants to explain to me why it took many decades for these cases to be heard, I'm happy to try to understand that legal side of it. But during this period of time, from 2000 to the current day, the FDA took a number of other actions. So this product was initially approved with a bunch of sort of safety things built around it. There was a REMS, which is a method to track adverse events. There was a requirement for three visits with a doctor. On one of those visits with the doctor, that was when you got the pill. In 2016, the FDA took away some of the restrictions on mifepristone, specifically It increased the time when a woman could get it. It was originally thought to be something that you could take in the first seven weeks of pregnancy. They extended it to 10 weeks. They eliminated the requirement to track the non-lethal adverse events. They permitted non-doctors to prescribe the product. They allowed a second dose of the medication. They allowed the drug to be given outside of the office. They lowered the visits from three to one, and they allowed mesoprostol, the prostaglandin, to be given sooner thereafter. In 2019, they modified REMS requirements. In 2021, they actually allowed mail order pharmacies to dispense the medication, and that was thought in part due to the pandemic where abortion would be harder to receive. The regulatory issues at the center of this case, there's a lot of issues of the legal issues, which is really do the people who are suing have standing. That's one of the key legal issues. I don't understand the legal issues. Somebody else got to do a video on that. I understand the regulatory issues. There's two parts to that. This drug got accelerated approval. Accelerated approval are for conditions, quote, safety and effectiveness in treating serious or life-threatening illnesses, end quote. So it has to be a serious or life-threatening illness. So there's a debate around whether or not pregnancy per se is serious and life-threatening illness. Number two, the drug had to provide, quote, a meaningful therapeutic benefit to patients over existing treatments, end quote. And there's debate about that as well. The long and short of it is the first part of the debate, the federal judge in Texas says that he doesn't think that being pregnant is a life-threatening situation because many pregnancies are not. However, some pregnancies are. And one of the arguments the FDA was making was that an unwanted pregnancy can cause depression. You might not feel great about that. And that is a life-threatening situation which warrants the use of accelerated approval. The judge says that he disagrees. By that logic, anything can cause depression. Ergo, anything can be candidate for accelerated approval, which by the way is kind of how it's used. It's actually used sort of really willy-nilly. But the judge says that the ent- the entity in and of itself has to be a life-threatening illness and not any downstream sequela. Um, that's the part that I don't think the judge is on firm grounds because, you know, diseases impact people in many different ways um, and healthy conditions impact people in many different ways. And uh, one can imagine that you could have really, really bad low back pain that is so bad you're depressed and maybe even suicidal from the pain. And that arguably is a life-threatening situation. It's not the pain per se, but if it's making you want to kill yourself, maybe there is the urgency to bring the drug to market. That's pain, low back pain. One could make the same argument here. To me, it's not entirely clear how one separates where does the causal 
sort of web of an illness end and what is the next illness. You know, that's really not very clear. Similarly, another analogy that may help my explain my thinking on this issue is that giving somebody the diagnosis of prostate cancer has been shown in some observational data sets to increase cardiovascular events, possibly due to treatment, and increase suicide, actually. And so one of the arguments against the PSA screening test, which has never shown an improvement in all-cause mortality in a randomized fashion, one of the arguments is that you're not really, if you look at prostate-specific cancer death, you're not really looking at suicides that may be attributable to the overdiagnosis baked into your test. And I've always been somebody who thinks we need to look at all of the consequences of our actions, even the ones that we may want to wash our hands of or distance ourselves from. So ergo, I think one could argue that a diagnostic test that gave people a lot of inaccurate, bad information, for instance, being overdiagnosed with prostate cancer, you're going to have to watch other videos to explain what overdiagnosis is, means getting a diagnosis for something that's not going to cause morbidity or mortality in your natural life. It's not going to harm you in this life. It's a bystander, really. If that causes some depression, well, you own that depression. That's a consequence of your test. Um, and similarly, that's used as an argument, I think, a good argument, why we need broader metrics of judging the efficacy of a screening strategy for PSA than merely looking at prostate-specific death because you're not capturing the off-target harms. Along those lines of reasoning, one could argue that you can make a test to test the lay public for Huntington's disease, which there's nothing you can do about if you have. The test could be horribly inaccurate. All these people are depressed because you tell them inaccurately that they have Huntington's, they don't. And maybe some of them are even suicidal because of that horrible information. Uh, and then you say, well, you know what? Actually, my test didn't do it uh, because actually they don't even have Huntington's. <laughs> so, but you know, it turns out that giving a false label does lead to that sequela. It turns out low back pain can drive somebody to suicide and it turns out that you know somebody who has an unwanted pregnancy could be depressed and could have a bad outcome ergo i think that it's probably hard to argue that it doesn't follow within the scope of accelerated approval the second argument to me is actually kind of interesting mifepristone must provide a therapeutic benefit over available alternatives the judge says that surgical abortion is more effective and it's likely to have a lower complication rate although he doesn't do a great job of getting into the numbers why he believes that latter claim, but he certainly believes the former claim that it has to be more effective. Why? Because it's often used in those situations where the chemical abortion does not go as intended to provide the definitive solution to the problem to the, to the issue, which is the person who wants to have the abortion. So he says it's better. The problem I have with this line of argument is he doesn't consider the third strategy, which is you can imagine a study that compares medical abortion to surgical abortion. Indeed, he may be right that it won't outperform in terms of the success rate at the goal. Um, and uh, it may have more complication medical abortion. I don't know. Nobody knows the answer. Uh, but a third arm where it's a reflex strategy, medical abortion first and then surgical abortion backup, which is really what's being implemented in the U.S., that may do even better by that metric and may have better quality of life, etc. The judge doesn't consider that sort of daisy chain strategy. And I think that is the weakness of his argument there. Okay, this is probably boring you, so let me get to the part that's interesting. The part that's interesting is, should the courts get to second-guess the FDA? I'm not sure I know the answer to the question, to be honest with you, because I don't think people who trained in law are the best at thinking about medical issues. Proof of that is that the judge's opinion in this case is not the way a scientist would think about things. At some point it says, you know, there've been 500 complications from this pill. My first thought was, well, well, how many people took the pill? I mean, is it 500 out of 600 or 500 out of 600,000? Wouldn't that matter? What's the denominator? You know, that's the first thing a scientist or doctor thinks. Judge doesn't think that. And wouldn't the judge want to compare the problems and adverse events of having mifepristone available against the counterfactual of not having it available which is not having access to surgical abortion in every state in America. And maybe some people are seeking back alley abortions or other sorts of problematic scenarios, and that will have a much higher complication rate. Shouldn't that be the counterfactual? The way a doctor or scientist would think about this question neutrally and the way a justice would think about the question are very different. So I'm not sure that legal training will help people sort out these regulatory dilemmas. Having said that, I don't think I agree with many of the liberal commenters who say that no one can question the FDA. Well, surely somebody has to be able to question the FDA. The FDA was not appointed by God himself. The FDA is a federal agency staffed with civil servants. The head of the FDA is appointed by the president. 
So are you saying the executive branch should control the FDA because he appoints the FDA commissioner? But I don't think you want that either because when Trump was president, nobody wanted Trump to be weighing in on FDA decisions. Nobody should want Biden to weigh in on FDA decisions, but it turns out he has because he put so much pressure on the administration to green light boosters and low-risk Americans that Gruber and Krauss resigned. You can go see my video on the channel. So people don't want the executive to do it either. Should Congress do it? Congress wrote the legislation that governs the FDA. In many cases, I think the FDA has exceeded the statutory authority given to them by Congress or misused it or abused it or misinterpreted it. So should Congress do it? But similarly, just as a judge is ill-equipped to police the FDA, Congress is ill-equipped to police the FDA, I think. I don't think they have what it takes to do it. So who polices the FDA? There's no, I think no one policing the FDA is not tenable. The FDA can misuse accelerated approval. That's possible. It would have been very interesting to me if the first suit to put a hold on a drug wasn't mifepristone, abortion, a very politically loaded topic, but was something like a cancer drug or an Alzheimer's drug, something where the bulk of the scientific community felt like the FDA made a mistake and erred. I've read a lot of things about this. Um, and I really ask people who are critical of the judge, and I am also one of these people critical of the judge, but I'm not one of these people saying that that judges can never or ought to never police the FDA. I'm not sure about that. I'm still uncertain. Somebody has to police the FDA. That's, that's what I want to start with. I really think that's the case, and here's why. The FDA is ultimately accountable to the American people, but the people who work there are not directly accountable to the American people. So it has to be either Congress, the legislative branch, the executive branch, or the judiciary that holds the FDA accountable, and maybe all of them do it to some degree. Now, that's why I think it would be interesting to pick a different example where liberals might have been more likely to say the judge was right. What if the judge ruled that the FDA violated accelerated approval to approve Exondis, which is that Bob Califf fiasco from a few years ago? a Duchenne's muscular dystrophy drug. I think that would be interesting because then it would make people really think about what happens when the FDA gets things wrong, which they do often, most of the time. In fact, I don't think they do a great job. Let me come to some of the comments I read, some of the comments I read. All right, there's a thread by a Dr. Rainey, who is in fact the uh, soon to be dean of the Yale School of Public Health, where you know she's critical of the judge and I'm not surprised because you know she's a uh, well-known liberal on all issues. Okay, so I'm sure she's critical of the judge. Got that. But here's the thing that I found really interesting about her thread. I'm going to put the tweet up. If it were unsafe about mifepristone, the FDA would have acted, exclamation mark. Just this week, FDA pulled approval for another medicine, Makena, that was used to prevent preterm births. It's not afraid to reverse its decisions when needed. Huh. Is McKenna a good example of the FDA using their regulatory authority wisely? Let me check. Uh, I think the answer is no, because, a, I'll put on the screen as well, an Office of the Inspector General report concludes that the FDA gave 64 months plan, past the original planned study date to keep this product on the market without taking any action against the company. This is a product that just doesn't simply doesn't work. There's a viewpoint in JAMA called the FDA's struggle to withdraw McKenna problems with accelerated approval. This was a big screw up at the FDA. They took years of delinquency while harms of this product continue to accrue and they did not pull it from market. So if you want to make a case that the FDA does a good job of policing reg medical products, this is the worst example, okay? <laughs> it's really not the good example. It's the worst possible example. Why does this person cite this example? I think this person doesn't really know regulatory politics and regulatory history and yet wants to comment on every topical issue. And I think that's one of the problems that we have these days, you know? You get a lot of likes to say the judge was wrong, but to really understand where is the judge wrong, what is the root of being wrong, you know, and to know the basic facts about McKenna, I think, you know, that's, that's a problem. I saw another tweet. I'll put this up. Viagra's risk of death is 11 times greater than mifepristone when used for medical abortion. I haven't checked these facts, but to me, this is such a bizarre <laughs> comparison because you do know that the, the demographic taking the product is probably different, I would guess. The median age of one is in the 70s and the other might be in the 20s or 30s. I would guess that being an old man with coronary disease uh, or all of the other illnesses that go hand in hand with erectile dysfunction, 
and being a young person who's pregnant might not be the same. So it's not really a fair comparison, would it be? I mean, if you really wanted to make the argument that it's safe, wouldn't the better comparison be to the harms of an unwanted pregnancy and bringing that to term the risk of pregnancy itself and the risk of some people, no matter what, seeking a, 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 a potentially illegal or back alley abortion and the sorts of horrific conditions that arise around that? Wouldn't that be the better comparison? I would think. I've read so much about how the judge, the courts should just stay out of the FDA. And in my mind, that's hard to say if they're doing such a shitty job, and they are. We have multiple government accountability office reports saying they don't enforce post-marketing commitments. Everything on plenary session for years, my show has been about cancer drug approval after cancer drug approval that is just delinquent, unethical control arms. They don't halt the studies. They're just not doing a good job. Somebody has to hold them accountable. So what are we gonna do? Do we need an independent agency within the executive branch to put a check on FDA? We certainly, I don't think we want whoever's in power as the president to be puppeting the FDA decisions. Ironically, I think Biden did more of that than Trump. I don't think we want that. Josh Sharfstein, who was a uh, Democratic appointee at the FDA, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about how Trump eroded the FDA's uh, integrity, but he left out the part of Biden putting so much pressure on them that Gruber and Krauss resigned. These were two vaccine administrators who didn't resign under Trump. So I don't think you want the White House doing it. I don't think Congress is able to do it. I don't know what the answer is, but I do think there is a broader question, which is that somebody has to be able to regulate the FDA and say, you are misinterpreting statutes. You are misinterpreting the law. They've abused EUA, for Christ's sakes, giving an EUA for bivalent booster for a six-year-old who had COVID twice. That's what they've done. They don't have the legal authority to do that. I think it's a misuse of the emergency use powers. I, I strongly disagree that they that to call that an emergency is 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 crazy. So what do we have here? I think we have an interesting case. I think uh, I think there is an interesting core question here. Obviously, abortion is a is a political issue. I think did the judge act politically? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure he did. Do all the people criticizing the judge act politically? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they are acting politically too. I think there's an interesting question, which is how much autonomy does the FDA have and what are the checks and balances on the FDA? It's got to be something. And I do think that the reality is no matter what anybody likes, there will be more prosecuting of the FDA, so to speak, in the courts. I think it will be. In the next decade, there'll be many, many more products. And if you are somebody who really wants to use the courts to attack the agency, I mean, just as a legal strategy, I would say pick some drugs that are that that are really indefensible. You know, some of these approvals that have nothing to do with a hot issue like abortion, a political issue like abortion. Pick an Alzheimer's drug. Pick a cancer drug that the right the data was just so bad. It's not hard, okay? Watch this channel a few times, and then take that and 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 show how the FDA violated the law, and point out the facts that the FDA reviewers frequently go to the pharmaceutical companies when they're done which we showed in BMJ, point out those downsides. Pick an issue that will be very difficult for anyone to disagree with that the FDA misused their powers. I think, and the thing I'll say, one thing very specifically, the FDA sometimes uses the regular approval pathway. They use a surrogate endpoint for regular approval. That surrogate endpoint, by their own statutory language, has to be quote-unquote established, which means it has a correlation coefficient of above, I think, 0.75 or 0.8 by their own statements. Okay, And then they have used that pathway without adhering to any of that statutory language. Use that as an example to break them. If you want to use the courts to break them, there, no one can claim that you're picking a political example. And you'll prove your point, I think. And so I, I think that's whether or not anyone likes it or not, that's what's going to happen. The FDA is increasingly politicized. It's politicized by both parties. Trump did put a thumb on the scale with his convalescent plasma EUA. Crazy. Uh, and hydroxychloroquine EUA. No, terrible. Uh, Biden put a thumb on the scale with the perpetual boosters for toddlers plan. Terrible, horrible idea. So both sides are putting a thumb on the FDA. And I don't think anyone's happy with that system. And I think naturally courts will be one remedy. Congress may be another remedy. Um, but it'll be interesting to see. And so, you know, ultimately, there is no, I think, ironclad principle that the FDA can never be questioned in the court of law. I, I don't think that's right. Um, but, you know, on this issue, I think that 
obviously the analysis presented in the judge's decision is not really a scientific analysis. I mean, it would have to have a denominator and compare risks and have some tables and build a case uh, that, you know, how exactly how risky it is. Uh, it does make some interesting points, I think, about how the FDA has loosened some of the requirements, um, but uh, it's not that compelling. Neither is, of course, in my opinion, comparing the risks of Viagra in an old person with an re- old man with erectile dysfunction to uh, 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 to uh, 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 mifepristone in a young person who seek an abortion that doesn't make a lot of sense to me either so we gotta see if you know i think illogical irrational views that uh are, are are just really just channeling the ultimate core thing which is you know you have your opinion on this issue and you're just sticking to that but i do think there's a deeper question here which is how does the fda make these decisions who is or where is the place to call them out if somebody thinks they did it wrong Um, And I think that's an important question. And I said to Dr. Josh Sharfstein, I'm very curious, who does he think should police the FDA? I asked him on Twitter. I didn't get an answer back. But I really think, I'm really asking, who do you think? Not the judge, of course. Congress, the president. You wouldn't like it if it was the other guy, but you like it if it's your guy. You like Gruber and Krauss resigning over that booster plan? You like that? I thought that was pretty, pretty tasteless. Those are my thoughts. I'm going to think about it more. And maybe actually there's a good opportunity to really come up with some solution here, some check and balance on the FDA that is less likely to be blown with the immediate political winds, more likely to have some enduring qualities, but a place where people can legitimately push back on the FDA. That's really the solution. And maybe there's maybe there's something to be said here. I'll mull that over. All right. Those are my thoughts on this issue. Very interesting couple of court rulings. Shout out to Vladimir Kogan, who emailed me both and encouraged me to read them. I'll be back. More videos on all sorts of topics. I think uh, I have some good ones coming soon. And maybe I'll do a short because I got something that's perfect for that. All right. You know what to do. Like this video. Like, subscribe, comment. I meant if you like this video. Like, subscribe, comment, and leave a message below. I'll be back next time.